I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network. So I have Dr. Moises Naeem on the phone, uh, the author of The End of Power, uh, Dr. Naeem, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, just a little bit of an intro. Uh, some people may have heard of you, some people may not have, uh, which would surprise me. But your book, The End of Power, uh, has been recommended by everyone from Bill Clinton to more recently Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, your former minister of trade in Venezuela from 30 years ago. You're a former editor-in-chief at Foreign Policy. You've been an executive director at the World Bank. You've written over 10 books, dozens of articles, and of course, we're going to discuss the end of power. But I almost feel like I should be talking to you about productivity more than the end of power. You've done you've done so much. Well, I don't sleep much. That's the explanation. You know, actually, I do. This is a naive question, but I do want to talk to you about productivity. Like, you don't sleep much, but, but sleep is good for somebody like what what's your what have you done today so far what do you do every day well my main activity I, I am a writer so i do spend a lot of time reading and writing and uh, so today was um i did that I, I i woke up i i worked out and then i have been reading and writing i write a weekly column uh and as you can imagine, one of the challenges of writing a column is how do you add value and how do you say things that have not already been said by everyone else? Do you ever get stressed when you feel like, oh my gosh, I've already said everything? Like there's, no, I can't think of there anything is, new. That's a great question. There is, a, there is some of that, but you know, I have been doing this now for for a lot, a long time. So by now, um, the, you know, it's it's familiar territory. This is my professional. I, I, I've been doing this for a long while. Well, what's great about your writing, and I can really feel it, you know, when I read The End of Power and, and other articles you've written, is you've been in the trenches. I mean, you've been um, involved with, you know, countries, companies, economics. You've, see, you've been there, done it. And now in The End of Power, you basically say that our usual definition of what is powerful, meaning, you know, perhaps we can coerce, you know, others into what we want to do. This definition is, is, is changing and even decaying. Um, do you want to describe what that means a little bit more? Sure. What I argue, you know, then the, the nature of power and the definition of power has not changed. Power is the ability of one 
individual or an institution to make somebody else, either another individual or another institution, to do something or stop doing something now or in the future. So that's the definition of power that hasn't changed. What the book, uh, what, I, what I argue in the book, is that power has become easier to acquire, harder to use, and easier to lose. Um, therefore, it is more diffuse. Uh, there are more people and, and, and actors uh, with power. And those who have power are more constrained, and very often they, they lose power, and therefore power is more ephemeral. And, and, and you give some specific examples that were very interesting. There's sort of the 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 one percent uh, in terms of political power, and there's the the well known one percent in terms of financial power. And and so you mentioned like J P Morgan Chase, but also you mentioned, of course, America. And how how have you seen American power decline or decay? And how have you seen like kind of financial power uh, decay from from the hands of the few to the hands of the many? Well, what I have seen is that those who have power um, have more constraints in how they use it and what they can do with it. By no means do I, do I imply that the world doesn't have uh, concentrations of power, pockets of great, great power or institutions or individuals even. You know, from the Pentagon to the Vatican, from the big banks to the big IT companies like Google or Facebook, uh, or Microsoft or Apple, um, the, the big oil companies or nations like uh, China and the United States or Russia, Vladimir Putin, th- those are individuals and institutions that are still very, very powerful. So the point is not to deny their power, and the point is to clarify that they are more constrained and limited in what they can do with it. Uh, think about Putin. Putin was perceived a while ago as the most powerful man in the world. And he continues to be very powerful, but um, today he is uh, facing, you know, his country is in dire straits in terms of the economy. It's, um, it has, it's being sanctioned by the international community. Its relationship with Europe and uh, with uh, Germany uh, is, is, has been declining and deteriorating. And um, at home, people are beginning to feel uneasy as the economy, the economic situations and living standards uh, decline. So, sure, Putin, Vladimir Putin is a very powerful individual, in fact, a very dangerous one. But on the other hand, um, he, he is more limited on, we, on his power from what he was uh, 10 years ago or even five years ago. Now, let's take a company like Google, which you just mentioned. I mean, Google controls almost all the search on the internet, which, which is a very powerful position to be in. And of course we can't predict the future, but it does seem pretty likely that Google will continue to be in its position of power. How would, how would the notion of kind of power decaying affect a company like that? So let's take exactly what you just said and, uh, uh, think about that conversation five or eight years ago. So if you would have said what you just said five or eight years ago, instead of mentioning Google, you would have mentioned Microsoft. Remember, a while ago, the company in the IT sector that was generally perceived as uh, the big, um, you know, the the big dominant player uh, that that was feared, and uh, it, it triggered reactions by the antitrust authorities in Europe and in the United States. You know, Bill Gates would spend an inordinate amount of time dealing with regulators and and antitrust uh, uh, agencies around the world. Uh, well, uh, today, not because of that, but because of the dynamics of technology and hyper-competition, globalization, uh, and others, and innovation and diffusion of technology, uh, today, uh, Microsoft is no longer the company that comes to mind when one worries about concentration of power. It's Apple, and it's uh, Google, as you said. So it's uh, the difference between looking at a postcard and looking at a film, at a, at a movie. Uh, you know, you can have a snapshot of a moment, and there is no doubt that, that today, and perhaps for a few more years, or many more years, uh, Google is going to be the dominant company in, in, in its space. Uh, but it is also true that uh, in the past that has not been the case. And 
Uh, we live in a world in which uh, companies and monopolies and companies uh, that concentrate a lot of market uh, uh, power, market share, are um, more at bay. Is this is this because in general across countries across businesses uh, in general barriers are no longer as strong? You, can, you it's hard to there's no such thing as kind of like mutual assured destruction anymore. Um, it's not like two major powers facing off and everyone is off to the side. There's lots of coalitions all across the place of what you call micropowers, whether they be businesses or countries. And these themselves could, in combination, get over the barriers of the major players. That's a very apt summary of the point. Yes, I think you have captured the essence of the argument. In order to be powerful, you have to have something special. You have to have a special attribute that your rivals and the subjects of your power don't have or don't have to the same expense that you do. If you're a company, you either have a technology or a very large balance sheet, a lot of capital, or if you are an army, you have uh, special weapons and unique technologies and lots of people on their arms. If you're a political party, you have lots of voters and money and, and institutional control. So you go down the list and, and th- there is a lot of, um, you know, power depends on having a unique attribute that shields the incumbent and protects uh, uh, the, the incumbents uh, from uh, the, the, the attacks of rivals that want their power or the pushback of their subjects. But you know, it, it, the, what I argue in the book is that the shields uh, are becoming less protective, and it's becoming easier for challengers to uh, overwhelm, circumvent, and undermine the barriers that protect the powerful. I, I wonder, though, if there's if, if a lot of this is related to at an individual le- level to skills and leadership. So, for instance, how do you build a coalition of micro powers to fight the big powers? Somebody's got to be a strong leader to build this coalition. And it could be the case, you know, leadership kind of has a timeline. People get tired, people lose their energy or they die or, or whatever. Uh, I'm wondering if we're, we're just experiencing, uh, not just, but part of this is we're experiencing a lack of uh, strong global leaders. Well, uh, then let's take a look at, um, at some recent uh, very dramatic uh, changes of power and see who were the leaders. You know, we have seen profound, dramatic, changes of power in the Ukraine, and we have seen them in Egypt, and we saw it in Tunisia. Those in Tunisia, you know, just people took to the streets and were able to unseat a a long-serving dictator, Ben Ali. In uh, uh, Egypt, uh, people took to the square, and and notably, famously, to Tahrir Square, and they were able to overthrow um, Mubarak, who had been also a long-serving dictator. And the same happened in Ukraine. And if I ask you, who was the leader of those uh, initiatives, of those movements, of these very successful, uh, you know, they grabbed power and they took power away from people that had had power for a long, long time. Well, you don't have a leader. There, it's very hard, you know, to pinpoint a name uh, that it was the uh, leader of the, uh, you know, the, the changes that we saw in those three countries. So what we are seeing is the emergence of uh, networks, more than hierarchies and more than the traditional forms of organization. We have seen collective action that is facilitated by social media and other instruments. We have seen the empowerment of people. You know, and I, I think that's a very powerful uh, uh, way of looking at it. I wonder, so, so that leads to two questions for me. One is, it seems like there's, because of, technology and innovation, there's sort of a democratization of people. So if you look at like a smartphone, it basically contains components that 20 years ago would have cost you a million dollars, now cost you just a few hundred dollars or, or even less. And I wonder if this democratization of almost all of our technical needs allows people to, you know, sort of, you know, flattens the, the playing field a little bit. In the book, The End of Power, I make the case that we need to be careful to explain the shifts in power in terms of technology. 
it would be uh, foolish to deny the importance of technology and deny the importance of what you just described, how uh, advanced technologies are becoming cheaper, more widespread, and easily accessible. And, and, and if people with access with those technologies have, uh, you know, have been able to amplify the power, they have been able to better organize, to, to even fundraise more effectively. So, you know, there's no doubt that technology has played a role. But what I argue in the book is that technologies are just tools. And tools require users. And users have intentions and goals and motivations. And therefore, it's very important to understand what are the forces that are not related to technology that are driving uh, the, the users of these uh, new social media and other tools. But, but, but that, imply, that, that implies that their motivations, that, that the motivations of the individual have changed. When visibly what we can see is that technology has changed. Uh, do you really, do you think that the motivation of the individual has changed through the years? Absolutely they have. Hmm. And we have seen since the year 2000 to today, uh, the largest, most intense expansion of the middle class that the planet has ever seen. Never before in history, humanity had experienced the degree of uh, uh, newcomers to the middle class that we have seen in this day, in this decade and a half. Uh, in places from chi China to India, from Mexico to Thailand, uh, from Turkey to uh, Peru uh, and Brazil. So we have literally billions of people that were very, very poor that have joined the middle class. This is not the middle class that you find in Sweden or in the United States. But this is a consumer class. These are people that were living into the poverty line in the past that didn't have any capacity to save or to really consume beyond their basic needs. They, are now, uh, they now have incomes that allow them to both save a little bit, but also they have become a consumer class. Yeah, and you, and when, you that, when that happens, uh, there, is, there are profound changes in your aspirations, your expectations, your motivations, and so on. We also have the planet that has been, this is the most urban planet that has ever existed. N never before in human history, so many, such a big proportion of humanity lived in cities as they do now. This is also the youngest uh, population that has ever existed on Earth. Uh, on average, the, the average age of the typical uh, inhabitant of this planet is now the lowest it has ever been. We have the largest number of young people that has ever existed. When you put data like this in context, you realize that we are going through what in the book, The End of Power, I call the three revolutions. The more, the mentality, and the mobility revolution. Right, so so I, I was going to ask you to basically go into depth more on those three M's because I think they're they're very interesting and of course they're intertwined. And they are uh, is what I use to explain what is bringing down uh, or or weakening the defenses that protected the the incumbent the incumbents the traditional um, power centers. So so the more is related to technology, essentially that everybody no. It, it, Okay. No, the more is related to the fact that we live in a world in which there is more of everything, starting with more people. It took humanity until the year 1950 to get to the 2 billion uh, humans in, in, in the world, in the population. Mm -hmm. Well, now we are 2 billion every, every 20 years. We're now at 7 billion. And so there is more people than ever, but we also have more cities than ever. We have more technology, we have more products, more services, more money, more countries, more currencies, more churches, more philanthropies, more terrorists, more armies. Just pick anything that has to do with the human experience and look what were the numbers in the, in the 1950s or the 1970s and look at what are the numbers now and you see that all the numbers related to what humans do and what humans have has uh, skyrocketed. And so that's a more revolution that has consequences for power because it overwhelms 
the barriers that protect the powerful, that protect the powerful and makes them less protective. But it's not just that we have more of everything, but the more we have moves more. Ideas and companies and religions and ideologies and businesses and terrorists and philanthropies and activists and, 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 and germs, everything moves more and it's more mobile. And there is a dimension of technology there, of course, that helps with mobility. And what happens with the move, the, 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 the you know, the, the more mobility is that uh, those that want to attack power uh, can circumvent the barriers. Power needs uh, a, a captive audience. And with the mobility revolution, uh, the captive audiences are harder to keep. And finally, the third M, after the more and mobility revolution, is a mentality revolution. Is the changes in expectations, aspirations, values uh, that drive people. You know, so so there's an interesting concept in here, which is it sort of seems like we're going from an, an era of a 10,000-year a era of storytelling to an era of platforms where anybody can tell a story. So by storytelling, I mean, you know, we went from villages to cities to kingdoms to empires to religious empires to, you know, military empires and economic empires like America. But these are all stories like nationalism, religious stories, uh, stories about what companies we work for and why they're great. But now we have we're moving to an era where you have like Facebook, which a billion people are on all across the world. And there's no real centralized power on Facebook, like forgetting the fact that there's a CEO. There's no real centralized power on Facebook. We can all log into there and tell our story and people can subscribe to that story or not. And, and you see the effect of these things on some of these uprisings, you know, mentioned in the book. Yeah, you're right. And what happens now is that yes, we have uh, not we don't have a dominant story. We have many, many stories, and everybody can tell a story. Uh, but again, the very interesting uh, aspect of that is that those, some of some of the stories are better told and better heard and more heard than others, uh, and they catch fire uh, in, in, and, and get get adopted and distributed more than others. And uh, so we are in, in flux in, in that way. We have a lot of, uh, we have a fascinating, um, bubbling world of, with ideas and possibilities. Well, what I, what I really like in your book, um, it almost sounds scary or not. It depends how you view it, the end of power. But there's a very optimistic point you make, which is that, you know, alongside of this, as you mentioned, you know, more and more people, like you mentioned since, on page 55, you mentioned since 1998, uh, more people in Africa than otherwise are living above the poverty line. Uh, since 2000, child mortality has decreased by more than 17% over and over. You have these statistics that are very positive. And it's interesting how a world where uh, power gets more diffuse uh, does sort of increase the power of the individual to rise above uh, our prior circumstances. Yes, and the world that I describe in the book, The End of Power, is a very optimistic world. There's much uh, to, to applaud and to welcome. Uh, in, the, in The End of Power, I describe how this is a world that is far more uncomfortable than it has ever been for dictators or for companies that are monopolies or for great concentrations of power. They, you know, they still exist, but they are more under pressure and challenged and, and, and more insecure uh, than in the past. So, so It's also a world in which a group of young people can get together and launch a company that changes the world and it becomes a global sensation. Or they can launch an NGO, a non-governmental organization that tries to do good uh, in the other side of the planet. Or they can become activists and, 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 you know, push for a political initiative in their own city or in their own countries. People that have historically been marginalized, excluded, um, have now more opportunity uh, to get the, their voices heard. I'm not saying that all, all of those groups that are excluded and marginalized are now powerful, 
All I'm saying is that they have a better shot than ever before at having a seat at the table. You know, there, there's kind of a scary part of that, which is that, of course, the macro powers don't want to lose to the micro powers and vice versa. So you have, when you say a small coalition of like young people who can get together to start a company, you can also have a group of young people get together and smash into the, and destroy the World Trade Center. So basically, as, uh, uh, as you call it, even uh, an NGO like Al Qaeda could potentially with just a, a few thousand dollars, uh, bring America to its knees in terms of fear, and that leads to trillions of dollars of, of wars. It's not like America has lost its ability to destroy and dominate other countries, but it's just now micropowers are challenging it to do so. So that. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. That's a, yeah, I, I agree with that perspective. What, what side do you think wins? <laughs> I mean, where, where does it, it, it there, there's such a positive outlook here and there's also a really scary outlook that I, I get, uh, I get nervous. I'm paranoid. Well, then again, um, it, that's okay. If, if, if there are the traditional powers in the private sector, in businesses, for example, are more challenged and there is more hyper competition and there is more, um, that's good for, for consumers. That's good for everyone. Um, the problem is when you have the fragmentation of power, too much fragmentation of power in democracies. When you have a democracy, but then the elected leader is constrained by so many different actors, the micro players, uh, from the media to, you know, the, 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 all kinds of checks and balances that are healthy and desirable but in some countries have gone and, uh, um, you know, have become excessive and paralyzed the, the nation. We have seen a little bit of that in the United States, where a few years back the government, the, the shutdown of the government, we saw also how the, 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 the government was uh, pushed by Congress uh, and threatened um, to, to stop uh, uh, honoring its debt. Uh, with, with what we call the fiscal cliff and, uh, you know, and, and not renewing the authority of the government to finance its operations, which would have caused a massive global financial crash. So, and, and those were micro powers. Those were groups of uh, uh, political groups that came uh, very quickly out of nowhere to gain power and become very influential. And then they, they, they created even more gridlock than what we usually have. Uh, in the United States. So the gridlock uh, and, and, and what Professor Frank Fukuyama at Stanford has labeled uh, vetocracy, coming from the word veto, n basically talking about the proliferation of, uh, of players, of uh, individuals, of groups, of institutions that don't have the power to impose their view, but do have the power to block the view of their rivals. Or, uh, and, and, and veto um, their, those initiatives. And so instead of having democracies, we have vetocracies where a lot of veto centers are limiting the options of you know, choosing a path and going forward. Uh, and they dilute, therefore, they be, the, the policies are you know, delayed, diluted, and they have to cater to the minimum common denominator because they have to cater to everyone. So that is the, the real danger for, uh, from, for democracies around the world from the perspective of the end of power. Well, what, what I love about the concept of a uh, vetocracy is, you know, and you mentioned this in the book, that foreign aid to other countries now has become less than just individuals wiring money to their relatives or friends in other countries or whatever uh, by a significant factor. Like, again, the power is going to uh, uh, the new economic power of the individual and the middle class uh, that we can actually, as, as a group, send more foreign aid than the largest governments out there by a significant margin. Exactly, and so that those are the new dynamics uh, that we will need to uh, um, understand and, 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 and realize that they are here to stay. You know, you mentioned that there's less landslides, there's less mandates, and I kind of see on a cultural perspective, you're seeing less books that sell 10 million copies. You're seeing less TV shows that have 60 million viewers. You're, you're seeing, um, you know, 
people have so many diverse interests that are now gaining our attention and are also, again, participating in these global platforms. Uh, the end of power seems to be happening also on a cultural level as well. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Absolutely. You, we can see the end of power in all of those domains that you have mentioned. We are seeing it on television, on uh, how, you know, there's fragmentation in television. It's quite amazing. Uh, and on books and in culture, but you can also see it in science and in philanthropy. It used to be that in philanthropy you had a, a few foundations that were, you know, the, the traditional historic foundation. Now you have a, a lot of very large foundations that are popping around the world. Um, you, in, in terms of science, you also had uh, the, the traditional centers of science, and now you have competitors coming from improbable places. Um, and, and in culture, of course, uh, also, and in sports. You can also, if you pay close attention to sports, you will also see how uh, you have, uh, you know, retaining power at the top of the league has become more difficult. So, so it see for for the person listening to this uh, who's always felt stifled by, let's say, their bosses or the big corporations or government power imposing on them. It seems like this end of power is an is can be viewed as an opportunity. Now is the chance to tell your story to to get on these platforms and and to express yourself in your own unique message. We can all kind of find our little micro powers that have an audience. Exactly, and you know, I don't want to to sound overly optimistic or naive, but it is a world that has more opportunities and offers more possibilities to the average human being than ever before in history. Well, Dr. Naeem, I really appreciate the time you've taken. I know you're very busy. Uh, thank you so much. The, the book is excellent, The End of Power. I highly recommend it alongside Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Clinton, and a million other people. So uh, great, great job, and I look forward to your next book. Thank you so much, and a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you, Moises Naeem. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. For more from James, check out The James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network at stansberryradio.com. And get yourself on the free insiders list today. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.